The portion of God's Word on which we'll focus our hearts this evening comes from John 18, verses 33 through 40. It's printed on page 8 in the worship folder if you'd like to follow along as I read it. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea? Jesus asked. Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews, gathered there, and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. The word of the Lord. Let's begin with prayer. Lord, sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. You are truth. Amen. Truth is pretty important. I don't have to tell you that. Because basically every relationship that we have in our lives in this world the success of that relationship is dependent on both parties being able to trust the other side that they're going to be telling them the truth. Spouses, parents and children, friendships, co-workers, employer, employee, teacher, student, counselor, counselee, the list goes on. If there isn't truth, There can't be trust, and the relationship will not work. And if you've been or experienced that kind of relationship without trust or without truth, then you know how taxing and toxic those relations without truth end up being. And that's especially true in a courtroom. As we know, when a witness gets up on the stand, they swear to tell the truth the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. If you're a juror for a trial, you take an oath to well and truly try the case and render a true verdict. And it makes sense, because think how ineffective the judicial system would be if jurors were deciding cases based on their own personal agendas, their own personal preferences, rather than making decisions based on the truth, that comes from the evidence. Or if witnesses got up into the witness stand and just threw out whatever lies or half-truths they felt like sharing rather than saying what they actually saw or heard. It wouldn't work because truth is important. And we understand that. And that's why it's not surprising as we see God on trial before a Roman governor this evening that the concept, the topic of truth, becomes a point of interest and focus in their conversation. Now these two men, they get to this meeting, this conversation, on very different paths. Likely Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, he was likely born somewhere in Italy, in the heart, in the midst of the most powerful empire in the world. Jesus, however, was born in Judea, Bethlehem, in a little insignificant village in a backwater region of Roman rule. As Jesus was growing up, learning the the trades of carpentry from his adopted father, Joseph, Pilate was probably training to be a soldier. And as Jesus was starting to gather disciples and followers, Pontius Pilate had already worked his way up the Roman bureaucracy to become the governor of Judea, which was a hard job. Because from the moment that the Romans had overtaken Judea, there had been constant 
uprisings, and rebellions. Different people who claim to be a king or a savior or a messiah who would set the people of Israel free from these horrible oppressors. And so it's likely that Pontius Pilate, the, the governor of Judea, had heard about this Jesus of Nazareth. He likely had heard the stories of his miracles, the huge crowds that followed him wherever he went, the, the chaos that he had caused on multiple occasions in the temple in Jerusalem. It's likely that Pilate had even heard what the crowds had been shouting when Jesus rode into Jerusalem that prior Sunday. Hosanna! Save us, son of David. All of which likely made Pilate concerned about Jesus of Nazareth. Especially because what was taking place at that time was the Passover festival. A massive festival that would have brought hundreds of thousands of Jewish people cramming together into the city of Jerusalem to celebrate together a very emotional feast and festival that focused and reminded them of how God had set them free from foreign oppressors. And so as Pilate is sitting in his palace thinking about the Passover taking place all around him, he probably saw the events taking place like a powder keg just waiting to explode. And so when the Jewish religious leaders, the Sanhedrin and the chief priests, when they shoved Jesus in front of Pilate's headquarters in the early hours of that Friday morning, Pontius Pilate wanted to know more about this Jesus of Nazareth, whether he truly was a threat or not. And so he gets right down to business, asking Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? But Jesus wanted to take this conversation in a different direction. He wanted the conversation to revolve around the explanation of what it meant that Jesus was king of the Jews. And so Jesus replies, Is that your own idea, or did others talk to you about me? What presuppositions do you have that you've heard from others? But again, we see Pilate political leader that he is, he wants to get right down to brass tacks. He wants to know the facts of this case that he's trying. And so he again says to Jesus, your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you've done? And Jesus replies, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. So Pilate finally thinks he's got a breakthrough. He's getting somewhere finally in this conversation with Jesus, and he quickly responds, so you are a king then. But Jesus wanted Pilate to know the truth. And so he replies, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. You want to know the truth, Pilate? That's exactly why I came. To proclaim the truth, that everyone might know the truth. That's the reason that I'm here. Which leads Pilate to ask the famous question that's often attached to his name. What is truth? Now, as a military man and a very practical political leader who had a lot of work to get done and probably wanted to get rid of this case as quickly as possible because he knew Jesus was innocent, it seems unlikely that Pilate asked this question because he wanted to get into a, a nebulous philosophical debate with Jesus about what the concept of truth really meant. More likely, what Pilate is saying with this question is your people and your religious leaders are saying one thing, and you're saying something different. So what's the truth? Who should I believe? And still, two millennia later, that question resonates and is applicable in our world too. What is truth? And although... Philosophers and scholars and religious leaders have been together debating the answer to that question basically from the beginning of time. You probably have perceived that in the last couple of decades or so, there's been a major shift in our culture when it comes to how we think about truth. You see, many people in the world today would subscribe to the tenets of what's called relativism. 
which is basically the idea that truth is a subjective concept. That truth is something that every individual has the right and ability to determine for themselves based on their own personal experiences, feelings, opinions, and emotions. And it's really not surprising that that way of thinking about truth has become such a, a prevalent thing in our culture and society. Because what this does is it allows us to basically decide whatever we want to believe, whatever we think sounds good, we can say that's the truth, that's my truth. And if people disagree, then we can get rid of arguments and fights altogether because if people disagree on something, well, we can just say, well, that might not be your truth, but it is my truth. And if truth is relative and subjective, then who are you to tell me that I don't know my truth? And that's especially true today in, in concepts like morality. The idea is that everybody gets to determine what's right or wrong for themselves and no one can tell you otherwise. It's prevalent even in religion. As different religious groups, Unitarians, Universalists, would all try and argue the fact that basically any belief system, any religion is valid. They all lead to God. Ultimately, you just have to believe in something strongly enough. And that sounds good, doesn't it? It sounds kind and happy and generous. It makes us feel good. It's an attractive idea for us to follow. But it's not realistic at all. You see, within the study of logic, there's this thing called the law of non-contradiction, which states... Contradictory ideas cannot both be true at the same time and in the same sense. Whether you realize it or not, we apply that law of non-contradiction regularly. When you're taking a math test or filling out math equations and one student writes on their test 2 plus 2 equals 4 and the kid next to him writes 2 plus 2 equals 5, the law of non-contradiction would say that teacher cannot say that both of those answers are correct because they're contradictory to each other. And in the realm of religion, if one person says that there is only one God and this person says that there are many different gods and this person says that there is no God, the law of non-contradiction says not all of those things can be true because they contradict each other. So as much as we like to assume or think that the truth is something relative, that all beliefs ultimately are true, as long as it's your truth, logic would say that's illogical, impossible. And yet we still sure like to try, don't we? Trying to convince ourselves that really, ultimately, our truth, our concept of truth, trumps God's concept of truth. Especially when God's word says that something we really enjoy, we really like to do, we really think is good, when God's word, God's truth says that that's wrong, how e easy is it for us to, to do the mental gymnastics to convince ourselves that our truth ultimately knows better than God's truth because I know my life better than the Bible does. Or if your friend is an atheist, we don't really want to say anything, and so we tell ourselves, well, they're just such a nice person, so who am I to say anything about, about the truth of God if, if that's not their truth? How easy it is for us to fall into that line of thinking, to make our actions and our thoughts and our words follow the idea that ultimately my truth is what matters, and my truth is more important than God's truth. Ultimately, every time that we sin, we're putting my truth over God's truth. And that's attractive, right? It seems good. It makes me feel good. It fills me with joy to follow my truth and my path and the identity that I have mapped out to myself. But ultimately, if we attempt to make truth Subjective, we're attempting to make ourselves God in our lives. 
But as Jesus tells Pilate in that court, there aren't many possible truths that we get to pick and choose our favorite from. The whole reason that Jesus came, his whole purpose in coming was to testify to the truth. Not a truth, the truth. And just a couple chapters earlier from our text in John, Jesus proclaimed to his followers, I am the way and the truth and the life. Not a truth among many different options that you can select from. The truth. And so with, we, the, with these words, Jesus is making a very exclusive, a very objective claim that there is only one true objective truth that governs all people and that applies to all people. You see, absolute objective truth, it doesn't care what you believe about it or how you feel about it or what you say about it. Because absolute objective truth can't be changed or altered in any way by what we do or say. And so maybe the better question for us is not what is truth, but who is truth. And the answer to that question that Pontius Pilate asks is the one that he's looking directly at as he asks the question. See, truth isn't a fact or a formula or a theory. Truth is a person. Jesus is the truth. Not just a truth, not just a teller of truth. Jesus is the truth. That's what he told Pilate. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And as he prayed for his followers the night before in the upper room, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And to know the reality of that, that Jesus is the one and only truth, you just have to follow the paths of where different types of truth will lead you. You see, Pontius Pilate, he knew the reality. He knew that there was nothing wrong. He knew that Jesus had done nothing that was deserving of death. And yet he so was blind to the truth that was literally staring him in the face that he ends up condoning the murder, <clears throat> the murder of the perfectly innocent Son of God because ultimately he decided to follow his truth rather than the truth. And those Jewish religious leaders, again, they had heard Jesus' testimony. They had seen his connection to the Scriptures. They had seen all the miracles that he had done. And yet they so refused to believe that Jesus was the truth that they were willing to trade in the only perfect innocent Son of God in exchange for a murderer and an insurrectionist named Barabbas. Don't lose sight of the irony of that verse. These same men that were attempting to get Jesus put to death by claiming that he was subverting the nation so wanted him put to death that they were willing to exchange him for a man who literally was a murderer and an insurrectionist and a danger to their society. See, the problem was they had exchanged the truth for their truth. And in both of those circumstances, the pursuit of their truth led to eternal and spiritual destruction. But the truth, the truth leads to salvation. As Jesus said a number of verses before in John's Gospel, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. See, my truth will always lead to destruction. My truth will always lead to slavery, to sin and death and hell and Satan. But the truth leads to freedom. The truth, Jesus Christ, leads to freedom from guilt or shame because we know the truth, that the truth has set us free from our sin. 
He gives us the freedom of living our lives knowing that we're walking in the truth and not having to discern what the truth might be. He gives us the freedom that we have in the promise of eternal life with Him. Because the truth is, the truth was willing to suffer and die and rise again for us. So cling to that truth. Rejoice in that truth. Cast away any other temptations to follow my truth or your truth and focus only on the truth. Because the truth has set you free. Amen. Thank you.